Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to the dedication of this uh, marvelous Mason & Hamlin CC Concert Grant. I wanted to give you a little bit of history on <clears throat> how we came to acquire this piano and uh, about the instrument itself. So when we got this wonderful new concert hall, the question became, what are we going to put on the stage as a piano? We'd used a piano from 1855. We used a little Wurlitzer spinet. And uh, you know, none of them are really suited for a more general type of, of use for all time periods, people with no experience with historic instruments. Um, <clears throat> but we also wanted something that wasn't just another modern Steinway piano. Um, we wanted something that, that was befitting uh, you know, a musical instrument museum. And so I had opinions on the subject and ultimately was tasked with coming up with uh, candidates for this uh, piano position. And I found three instruments, two Steinways and a Mason and Hamlin. And our board voted and decided they wanted to pursue the Mason and Hamlin. And you may or may not have heard of this company before, but at the time this instrument was made, in 1901, Mason and Hamlin's were actually, the, this would have been the most expensive concert grand you could get from an American manufacturer. And they were really quite well known. They were a, a storied Boston company. And um, I'll give you a little history about uh, the company. It was founded in 1853 by Emmons Hamlin and Henry Mason. Emmons Hamlin was a mechanic and Henry Mason was the son of a uh, hymn writer. And the original company product was not pianos at all, but in fact reed organs, which were very popular in the 19th century. The company began making pianos in 1883, and they actually didn't start with grand pianos. They started with upright pianos, which were very popular at the time. And they made grands a little bit later. In 1895, they hired a German named Richard Gertz, he had been the, uh, in a family of piano dealers in Hanover, Germany, and had also worked for Steinway for two years as a teenager in the 1880s, then for another US dealer. He um, got into piano designing and scale designing with his brother Emil, and consulted for Mason and Hamlin in 1894, and uh, was hired the following year uh, on a full-time basis to redesign their piano products um, as scale designer. What a scale designer does is design the plan of the instrument, the string, um, how it's laid out, the geometry of the instrument. Um, it's, it's really a cross between instrument building and uh, engineering, especially when you're talking about large instruments like this. So the manufacturer went from an older style of construction using multiple pieces of wood to construct the case to using a single fully bent rim, which you can see the instrument curves all the way around without a joint anywhere. Um, Steinway had started doing this a bit earlier, but then uh, Mason and Hamlin uh, joined with the um, Gertz designs. The uh, first of these to be introduced was a smaller piano than this. It was six foot four and it was, it's called the AA. It's still in production in 1898. And then in 1900, you had the BB, which was larger at seven feet. That's considered a semi-grand. And then the CC, which is this model, which is the concert grand, the biggest one, which is nine foot three. So these designs were notable for having very, very heavy construction, very thick beams and a thick rim. And this rigid construction it's, it's kind of the opposite of the harpsichords that you sometimes see from us, where being light and having free uh, vibration of the body and a, and a lower tension makes it more resonant. For a piano where the hammer strikes the string rather than uh, a quill plucking it, you want um, a really rigid structure so that all the energy of the vibration stays in the soundboard, producing a fuller sound and, and more volume. The extra wide soundboard of the CC and a significantly oblique angle. This angle here is not 90 degrees. It, the instrument actually curves quite a bit this way. Um, allows extra space 
around the bridges in this area, extra soundboard space, which can all uh, resonate. And so um, that contributes to the uh, unique sound of this instrument, which has a, a really full and, and lovely bass and tenor sound. The flagship CC model, the Concert Grand, launched in the 1900 to 1901 tour of Harold Bauer. Harold Bauer was originally a violin prodigy who then switched to piano. He had, he had originally approached Steinway to sponsor his concert tour and uh, was turned down. He wasn't well enough known. But Mason and Hamlin took him up, and Henry Mason in particular um, helped with his tour. Um, so there were two instruments, CC instruments, that were supplied starting in November 1900 for his concert tour, but there are also two other instruments produced at that point um, that had been sent to Steiner Tone, which was uh, the main, uh, well, uh, Steiner and Sons was the main dealer in, um, in, Bo in the Boston area where Mason and Hamlin was based. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting about touring uh, musicians at the time, now you can take for granted that anywhere you go in the country, in any you know, semi-major town or city, they're going to have a somewhat suitable piano. You know, some might be better than others. But at the turn of the century, that was not the case. There may not be any pianos. Or there might be something that is completely broken down or at the wrong pitch. There were just fewer pianos in circulation at this point. Fewer had been made. Fewer had been sold. And you had a lot of frontier towns that, that maybe didn't have anything suitable. Um, <clears throat> and so it was traditional in this time period, through the 19th century and into the 20th, that a musician would actually take their own instrument and technician with them on tour and it would travel around by trains. And that was the only way you could ensure that you actually had a suitable instrument on which to play everywhere that you uh, were booked to, to play. The, um, also, there was a lot of financial risk involved for the performers. Unlike now, when you, know, you get, have management and get booked for space and get paid, back then artists would have to um, rent a hall, and if they didn't sell enough tickets to pay the rent of the hall, they lost money. So the piano sponsorship, um, where the piano company would supply the piano and technician, was a very important way of taking some of the financial risk out of uh, touring. And while the musicians, some may have been paid, but probably most weren't, um, this uh, basically made it possible for these musicians to, to make a business of touring. Um, the uh, National Music Museum's particular CC is part of the second batch of these instruments in the, in the ledger books. It's number nine. Um, it's also perhaps the last, if, if any of you know Mason and Hamlin history, it's, it's, they're very famous for having something called a tension resonator, which was developed by Richard Gertz. And what it is is a, a metal spider that, that goes into the rim and has a hub in the middle, and it kind of pulls the, the, the rim in. And that was originally designed to prevent the crown or arching of the soundboard from flattening, which it really didn't do. But what it did do is help increase the rigidity. This instrument doesn't have it. It was probably one of the last of the concert grants that didn't have it. They were developing these new technologies kind of incrementally. And so uh, every one was, uh, in some ways, a bit experimental. Um, so the version, this, this model is still being produced today, but uh, there are different versions of it. And this is the early version, which has a particularly big and wide soundboard. This instrument is about 15 to 1600 pounds. That's 50% uh, heavier than a Steinway D, uh, the, the Steinway Concert Grand. It's truly a uh, massive piano. Mason, Company, uh, Mason Hamlin Company is still in business. It's owned by the Burgett family. It's a family-owned business and employs only 25 people, if you can believe it. Uh, but they still produce uh, marvelous instruments. Um, I did want to say uh, a little bit about um, how we got this to the stage. This instrument belonged to a friend of Darcy Cronin, who was the curator at the MFA in Boston and an alum of USD and uh, uh, had gotten his degree here. And, um, Charlie's a very avid collector and historian of historic um, pianos. 
And uh, he had offered this instrument for sale. And I kind of had my eye on it, but I was a little bit leery of it. It was quite big, bigger than a lot of the things we were looking at. But it was very historically inter interesting. These are very, very rare, very technologically developed uh, pianos for their time period. And this was a, a time period when, you know, the ubiquity of the Steinway was not a given. There were a lot more uh, designs and, and sound elements available. Um, but we went ahead and looked at it. And um, we've been very fortunate to work with an extremely gifted piano technician, Ken Eshte, who um, actually, he and I overlapped at Northwestern University, though we didn't know each other at the time, uh, back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s. Um, Ken is, is a unique, has unique skills as both a high-level concert technician and also a trained museum conservator. He's, as far as I know, the only one with those qualifications, and, and fortunately, he's very interested in this project. He was here uh, for the delivery of the instrument in June and uh, did absolutely brilliant work with um, uh, replacing the hammers, um, doing the regulation, and he's actually uh, here now uh, doing more work. He prepared the instrument today and is working on us, working with us uh, on uh, some more historic piano restorations. And uh, you know, finally and, and not least, I'd like to thank the uh, Grittners for being intrigued by this interesting instrument and stepping forward to make this uh, really spectacular resource on campus uh, possible for us to, to share with you. And it's going to have uh, just a tremendous impact on um, the quality of music making on this campus and the opportunities. So thank you very much. Thank you, Arian. We appreciate it. That's Arian Sheets. She's our string and keyboard curator here at the National Music Museum. And I'll just piggyback off of that. Our goal is to get to the sound because it's all about the sound of this instrument and the music that it will produce tonight. My name is Dwight. I'm the director of the museum. Part of my role is to put all these pieces together and make sure that whatever is selected by the curators, that we can fund it, that we can get it here, that we can promote it, and we can have people involved with it. So our mission really was to, to put a piano on this stage that would showcase everything we want the museum to be and everything that we want it to represent in terms of community involvement, in terms of our involvement in bringing professional artists here, and certainly our partnership with the USD Department of Music. So we, as we were fishing with this plan of trying to get this Mason and Hamlin on board, the, the NMM Board of Trustees is also wrestling with trying to fund the reopening of the museum and the permanent exhibits, and we thought, well, how can we find money to also get this piano here even though we know it's going to be so crucial and it's so important for us. And about a year and a half ago, I was in Pier working with some uh, legislative advocacy, and I, I went down to the lower level of the Capitol in Pier, and there was a woman at the gift shop there, and we struck up a conversation, and we started talking, and I said, do you know anything about the National Music Museum? And she said, well, no, not really. So just over a course of time, over about the last 18 months, uh, we developed a relationship, and uh, one day I just sent them uh, a whole packet of information about the National Music Museum, books and things to read, and I had a copy of Arian's proposal about the three pianos. I said, oh, I'll just kind of slip this in there and see what happens. And so a, a few weeks later, they sent me an email and said, hey, we're traveling, but when we get back, we want to talk to you about the piano. So I, I didn't find this out until just a few minutes ago at supper with them. They, they strategically and tactically said, let's make Dwight's day and call him at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon in the office. <laughs> First of all, let's see if he's in the office at 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon. But they did. 4 o'clock on a Friday afternoon, a few months ago, they called us and said, are you really still looking at the Mason and Hamlin? And we said, well, yeah, we think that's the instrument for us. And they said, we'll purchase the instrument for you. So we, it just absolutely brought a ray of sunshine, and it really has ever since. So when we're able to announce it to music faculty and students, and so we are so grateful that uh, Ga Dr. Gary and Connie Grittner are here with us tonight from Fort Pier. Uh, this is Dr. Gary and Connie Grittner. Would you mind to stand and let us acknowledge you tonight? If you're interested on the back of your program, upcoming concerts, this Sunday afternoon is the Sioux City Symphony Orchestra String Quartet. They will be on this stage, so please join us back. This concert tonight is also being live streamed, so if you're joining us by live stream tonight, we appreciate that. Especially Charles and Mary Jackson in Boston. If you've got the link, if you're joining us, this is the home of Charles and Mary Jackson where this instrument used to sit, and she was teaching piano lessons on it. So I hope that they're joining us tonight. If so, 
Thank you very much. Now it's all about the sound, and nobody better to start our program tonight than one of USD Music Department's own, Dr. Ali Ferris.
something in a desert. There was some place wild and green, and a child in a village I passed through. There are places that I've traveled, and so many things I've seen. But they all fade away. But you,
He wrote this piece in 1915, so not too long after this piano was built, and that's why I thought it would be an appropriate thing to play. Um, it's from a, a, a group of pieces that he wrote called Roman Sketches, all of which are based on poetry by William Sharp from 1891. So I thought I'd read you the poem just to sort of set the stage for the piece. And the language is rather flowery as it <laughs> was in those days. <laughs> Here where the sunlight floodeth the garden, where the pomegranate reareth its glory of gorgeous blossom, where the oleanders dream through the noontides, where the heat lies pale blue in the hollows. Here, where the dream flowers, the cream white poppies silently waver. Here, as the breath, as the soul of this beauty, moveth in silence and dreamlike and slowly, quite as a snowdrift in mountain valleys, when softly upon it the gold light lingers. Moves the white peacock as though through the noontide a dream of the moonlight were real for a moment. Dim on the beautiful fan that he spread. Dim on the cream white are the blue adumbrations. Pale, pale as the breath of blue smoke in far woodlands. Here, as the breath, as the soul of this beauty moves the white. Thank you. 
of the piano. Oh. <laughs> Mr. Ken Ashte asked if he could help move the piano, and we thought that would make him more comfortable since he rebuilt it. <laughs>